<laughs> um sorry i can't actually hear anything um it would help if i turned myself on mute, <laughs> on mute. Yeah, that would be that would be great <laughs> uh, so welcome everybody uh welcome to the artist focus with Kiki Twizzleman. Thank My you. name is Sorry. Colin Little and I'm the organizer of Out of Sight, uh, the Artist Collective. And um, today I'm very excited to present the work of Kiki Twizzleman and to be in conversation with you. And um, just to give a little bit of context, the first work that we shared uh, was called um, Sleeping With Reason Produces War. Kiki has many years of practicing both in Northern Ireland, in Belfast, during the Troubles, and um, then you know, has worked quite significantly um, in Europe and internationally. 
And please, you know, we recommend her full bio is in the body of this archive video and also on the website at on the artist focus page so please re read the extensive archive and i want to jump straight in and um thank you so much for joining us and being here with us today kiki well thank you karen just for inviting me um yeah um uh, it's always been a uh um, not really a problem, really, but um, my name is actually pronounced Kaika. Kaika, yes. yes. <laughs> ask, but we didn't have any time before. <laughs> live. So, uh, yes. doesn't, okay. No, it doesn't matter, but it's probably yeah. a bit hard for English speakers. Um, but anyway, um, my uh, performance artwork um, is uh, actually not only uh, my only art uh, work so i have a wide scope i normally derive ideas from things i see um you know in in my daily life and reflect and uh the political events that happen around us um currently locally and in the world so um my first triggering of like i need to go out uh, of the studio and not paint anymore just I'm always a painter, but I uh, um, I just like was really shocked by um, the sense of normality in Belfast, uh, in Northern Ireland, the whole world in Belfast, what I experienced in the 1980s, where um, you have all those really horrific um, events happening and uh, it just like happens to be at the wrong place at the wrong time. And then you're drawn, drawn into it, but life just um, washes over all that immediately and um, you just go to work, you go shopping, you go home and, you know, you go, uh, uh, in the 80s you could just go to restaurants as well, in the 70s it was um, not really possible. Um, but yeah, it, it was just this kind of shocking realization that, um, psychologically you had to make that sort of division in your mind and in your behavior uh, to um, just pretend everything is normal nothing to see here and um, and how did this um, impact you know just to kind of rewind a little bit and because were you living in Belfast, Northern Ireland prior to going to art school or did you go to art school? Did you move to Northern Ireland to go to art school? Um, yeah, I was invited uh, to study in the University of Ulster um, at the art college yeah. there. And um, so I just applied as a painter and, you know, was recommended um, to go and, and uh, apply for, for the course um so and how did the context of you know going to art college you know in in belfast how did that shape uh your approach to your to your art and as you said you were painting up initially but what was the shift that happened to inspire you to take it outdoors and onto the streets well that was that was exactly what i mentioned you know this, this sense of like um with everything that happens around you you cannot possibly um you know calmly paint in your studio and do nice pictures mm -hmm. <laughs> so you really had to um you know react uh to what was happening around you and um almost ma make some kind of waking up call statement and so my first um what I, at that time I actually called it a moving sculpture I wasn't really realizing I was doing a performance art piece mm -hmm. um it was called please keep the door shut as they tend to come in and slaughter us which meant um I was um getting poured over covered in uh, real blood that was cow's blood uh, in front of the city hall in Belfast and uh, made my way back to the art college, uh, the main shop street, um, handing out leaflets um, that I'd printed on before, um, just saying that, please keep the door shut, as they tend mm. to 
Lynn and Slaughter Us. So you have all that them and us division. And um, I believe strongly in that uh, idea where somebody um, who actually comes from an outside point of view to a political situation um, can actually almost with their own um, yeah, life's experience and their own uh, detachment to a, a certain moral issue uh, have a much better grounding than uh, somebody who's already in the midst of it and so much entangled emotionally and um, possibly morally or opinionated that you can actually um, you know, make a, a more neutral um, point of view and a more neutral statement to what you are experiencing and maybe what everybody else is experiencing. You sort of like take yourself back from a more of a bird's eye point of view in that respect as an artist. Well, I think, um, yeah, that that is the the role of art is, mm. in, you know, to observe um, our, our society and respond to it. Can you, talk about uh, we shared the sleep of reason produces war which was the first performance we started with mm. that that was um you talked about uh, moving sculpture that was a durational piece can you tell us a little bit because it starts in inside a gallery um or inside a a, a building and then it moves to the outside. We don't see much of what occurs on the um, in the outdoor spaces, but we see some banners in the video, um, which has the text of the title of the performance, "Produces War." Mm -hmm. Can you can you kind of talk us through that that work and what you know the process of making that and what it was in response to? Yeah, it was. Um, it was actually uh, the the quote at the start was basically like um, a, a quote from Plato, um, translated from a, a German <laughs> book. <laughs> but um, so it was. It was the the general gist of like why do does humanity need wars? You know, one kind of reflection on the Socrates dialogues. Um, However, uh, at that particular time, that was 1994, actually, um, at that time, the RA had actually announced a, a ceasefire. And uh, we actually had a first um, yeah, glimpse of hope that there might be finally maybe some tiny chance of a step towards peace or some kind of talks on towards it, but it wasn't quite so sure. And um, uh, it was just very, it could have just flipped any second back to um, severe violence. So um, it was just a tiny, tiny breath of fresh air. So my um, performance, um, The Sleep of Reason Produces War, was uh, almost like a little pun from the Goya uh, etching, The Sleep of Reason Produces monsters but also um the monster being basically uh you know the dehumanization of almost like a, a war-like situation um so uh it was the figure of the performance artist uh, in the sand pit almost like a, a little ch ch childish playground buried underneath the sand emerging uh with four chairs from all sides, you know, like the, the possible parties to negotiate with. So um, the um, uh, way was actually a very, very, very slow movement with all those four, four chairs tied to the body, um, negotiating the space and um, negotiating time and space. At that time, moving outside, unfortunately, the um, Photographs have been lost um, in time, but uh, so it uh, ended up the uh, the actual title of the performance was uh, painted on each chair. So in the end, you can uh, see the 
close-ups of the chairs. Um, it was like a very, very slow process. It could, took a couple of hours um, and I speeded up, um, the already speeded up 30 minutes. You find the 30-something uh, minutes somewhere on YouTube, it is a bit longer. I think you get a couple of more images there. And uh, so it was uh, a very slow growing um, process, almost like, uh, yeah, um, what people could maybe associate with um, later on would be a bit, a little bit like Bhutto dancing, but it wasn't, it wasn't really my intention to um, have any uh, connections to that art form. Really, it was, it was just like a, in my mind, it was just like the uh, an action that was reflecting what was actually happening at that time in, in that space politically. Um, yeah, so that, I mean, the whole kind of uh, negotiation process was uh, a very slow, long and entangled process. And I lo love like how the chairs, you know, become this kind of entangled. Um, we're still kind of um, living through the those negotiations today, you know, with the political stalemate that mm. it's more than yeah now. yeah it's always so. it's still ongoing and um you know after the uh good friday agreement um um in 1998 i did um uh the chick feet uh performance if you find the slide for that okay Number, um, let me which, which sorry which or I can maybe, uh, I don't know if I can find that. It's mm -hmm. um political. Uh, Is it, can you tell me, can you see the slides as they're moving through? No, I can't see it. Seven slide. No. Maybe. I think it's possibly only on your, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, that's that's a different one. Um, that's basically interactive performances. Uh, that's the quantum physical. It's more interactive. That's poetry. Um, yeah, I think that's more the philosophical uh, folder of that okay. slideshow. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, that's that's one of the um, earlier ones from. Uh, the late 80s, early 90s, I think it was maybe even 89 or 90, I can't remember really. It was, it was just um, like a, a quote from uh, the bin protests and the alarm system they used to have in the 1970s in Belfast where uh, any time the British Army would um, arrive, you know, the, the women would warn each other with bin lids. Uh, in those days, there were still metal bin lids. Um, to make a lot of noise to warn that you know the there's going to be another house read and stuff. Mm -hmm. Just one further, maybe um, one image. Oh, that's like a <laughs> Can you yeah. That's that's part of that's that was part of actually eighty nine. I was talking about that was after the Good Friday Agreement, and this one here was um, before the Good Friday Agreement. This was called. Uh, can a chicken save the hope for peace in Northern Ireland? So it was uh, the figure of a chicken um, uh, trying to fly with the weight of like a lot of rocks tied to the arms or wings and then making a big sort of almost theatrical fuss about it. And uh, afterwards uh, handing out white peace lilies to the audience um, and when each lily in the stem was like a, a nail nailed into, that was uh, roughly around Easter time. I did that, so it, was, it had the sort of connotations of nailing to the cross or um, the peace lily with a thorn or, you know, those kind of ideas I had behind it. Uh, so the, the other one was the one before with the carrots, if you have that. Yeah, that was part of... Um, uh, a festival I was invited to in Belfast uh, in the, the old sewers uh, in the dogs part 
And um, this was right after the Good Friday Agreement, um, a series of almost a daily um, shooting of taxi drivers that occurred. So uh, um, everybody in the world thought, oh, great, you know, they've achieved peace and, um, you know, now everything is going to go to plan. Um, uh, the way it actually really happened was um, uh, taxi drivers being called uh, from one part of the community uh, by another part of the paramilitaries and um, actually rung up into a trap and then shot. So it was like uh, really almost like murder to order. And uh, my performance there was... Uh, well, a more abstract reaction to it, I called it um, selecting carrots and a red herring. And the red herring um, was um, almost like, a, on hindsight, a thing where a lot of these murders actually had been condoned by the British Secret Service, who was part of uh, yeah, monitoring activities on both sides of the paramilitaries. And uh, almost sometimes said, no, no, um, uh, don't do, you know, we, like, don't do anything against it to the police or army or whatever. Um, uh, we uh, don't really want to blow our, um, our moles cover on this. So it was almost like, a, you know, insanity really had free reign mm. back in those days. Uh, mm. Yeah. And, you know, I think, you know, this, um, so, you know, at what point did you kind of have an aha moment for yourself in thinking, oh, I'm not doing moving sculpture, I'm actually, you know, doing public performances? What, what was that moment for you? Um, it was actually a reflection on what I'm actually doing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> yes, and after I did the the first um, moving sculpture um, in Belfast City Centre, um, you know, it took me ages to actually clean up and have a shower and get rid of all the blood. So I was at the Students' Union bar having a drink, and then Alistair McLennan came up to me. He was um, in the uh, uh, head of the MA course at the time. And he sort of asked me, are you one of my students? And I said, no, I'm actually first year Bachelor of Arts. And he was like, ha. Huh. And I thought like maybe he was quite relieved. He didn't <laughs> have to like maybe engage into, I, I don't know what, but he was like, oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> I don't actually know what went on in his head. I have to ask him, I've never asked him. But um, so yeah, that was that was part of like then reflecting. I, I really had this, um, idea of I have to do this and how I'm going to do it and what I want to say. But then afterwards you do more abstract reflections on your on your artwork usually. Um, I and think I, this is a good, way, a good moment for us to actually segue and share that uh, video of that shares that shows that performance. Yeah. And I, yeah. I had yeah that would be great. I had I have actually um if anybody's interested, I could, um, you know, please comment or post me. Um, I can send them a PDF copy of my uh, thesis, uh, The Politics of Art. And there's a lot of ideas behind it expressed. Um, uh, you know, it's basically uh, more the uh, philosophical part of the politics of art, not and, and socio sociology bit of it and, and reflections on it. It's not just like, oh, bang, I have a, a political event and then I'm reacting to it or something. You know, that's more the reflective part of it. Um, yeah, let's shoot we're ahead and see the... Get, we're going to get into that um, after, but I think it's important for people to, you know, see the work. Yeah, that's part um, of my early work sort of... Um, a uh, compilation I did just last summer, actually, I thought, God, I've got so much material and let's start and select something and put it together. It's a four minute little movie I put together from different early performances. And, you know, just to let um, the audience know that this does come with, um, 
you know, you might find some of the images in this uh, documentary difficult. Um, so just to, you know, it is four and a half minutes long. Yeah, and it's not it's not for children. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so let's. Uh, Um, I think really the main reason is that we, for probably during the troubles people were living on the high. There were sometimes um, when they were bereaved of their loved one, they were followed closely by somebody else being bereaved. And for that reason maybe they didn't have ample time to grieve properly. Um, another reason possibly is that um, in terms of whenever paramilitaries would come into people's homes, the people's, people were maybe afraid to speak out, afraid to show their feelings in case uh, their um, relatives would ever become involved in, in terms of retaliation. Um, and I think that was really one of the, um, another main reason why people maybe now um, are starting to, to, feel, you know, to feel their, their loss and, to, and start to feel the need for support and for help you know, in dealing with it. But the bitterness and the resentment and the bigotry is still there to be tackled.
it. Oh, hello, welcome back, everybody. I, I think, um, yeah, so in terms of what I want to, this is something that I am very passionate about, um, you know, especially working in the context of Chicago and, you know, dealing with the violence that exists in public space um, there. And, you know, I'm interested, you know, what is your, what do you think the, um, the, sh the impact of creating your performances in public space had, you know, when, you know, there was a very, there was such a um, restriction of freedom, you know, by the militarization of the city by the British paramilitary. So what do you think the role of public performance had in that, in that context? Well, it was, um, it was sort of like a, a situation where, uh, you know, the paramilitaries on the loyalist side, uh, UDA, UEF, or whatever, and the paramilitaries on um, the uh, nationalist side, the RA, or like a uh, provisional RA, or, um, uh, you know, those um, groups uh, were... Um, at some point active in the city center, uh, you know, to create havoc or whatever. Um, and um, then uh, the uh, Royal Ulster Constabulacy, uh, the RUC, were, well, they were, they were mainly made out of Protestants. Um, a lot of um, their members are actually, were members of the Orange Order as well, so they were, like quite side sided at the time, um, you know they're not they were, they were not neutral. Um, the British Army were not necessarily neutral either. So you had uh, people actually uh, in those um, uh, yeah official forces, um, uh, the police force and the army, um, who were always aware that something could be a trap to them. And uh, so as a performance artist in those days, you had a bit more freedom of um, uh, yeah, staging, <laughs> so to speak, or ha like having a performance at a certain space uh, happening uh, without too much, um, you know, prior um, permits or, uh, you know, bureaucracy. Um, to apply for because you just basically did it and it was important and you just really didn't really think of um, the consequences by uh, the police, you know, possibly. Um, I think uh, you have to really gauge your actions very, very carefully. If you're um, doing something um, that you really passionate about, say, in Chicago at a certain space, at a certain time, you would need to, um, yeah, uh, really know um, a lot about what you're doing um, and why you're doing it and uh, basically the forces behind you. So you really need to gauge your chances of being able to do it, what impact it would have with people. And... Um, I was sometimes uh, in those days in Belfast. I was sometimes very um, aware of maybe uh, almost traumatizing the traumatized. Yes. Yes. But people were already so traumatized at that stage that um, you know it was like very clear to them that this was acted, so to speak. You know, this wasn't real. You know, this wasn't like you know a real life violence. This was somebody actually saying something about what was happening every day or what they would see on the news every day. So, um, well, was... would you apply the, um, you know, the philosophy of the abject, you know, in, in actually creating these, like, re by holding up the mirror? to the violence and replicating the violence that people were witnessing in their lives, 
were you creating a moment? I, I'm wondering what the impact was for the public. Witness. Well, it wasn't. It wasn't actually a you know a battle recreation or recreating the ex exact act of violence. Um, the public execution, for example, which uh, you know might have quite a shocking image with the chopped off um, latex hand, which was an exact replica of my hand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and that was that was basically as far as like I ever did a performance uh, that was more a bit like almost like theater, you know, with not really chopping off your hand, obviously. Yeah, um, it looked very real. I was like, yeah, yeah, I was this, a bit the first time I saw it. <laughs> yeah, but this had this had the context of um, actually most people really understand uh, at that place and, and especially at that time of uh, the meaning of the flag, which is very important, um, still is a uh, you know, highly contested object um, mm -hmm. in Northern Ireland. And so you had the trickler, you had the, the white bit in between, in the middle um, with the bloody stamp on it from the, from the right hand. And uh, part of it was um, Union Jack, and, but the whole flag was in gray, so you don't really know whether it's a gray zone or not. Um, the uh, st stamping of the hand, the red hand of Ulster basically stems back from uh, a time whenever um, sort of more myths and legends um, uh, were like um, the uh, part of Ireland, which later became um, a little bit of a Northern Ireland. Uh, by political design um, was contested between two sons of a, of a chieftain or king or whatever and so it was decided uh, whoever wins the race and touches um, the land first that they're going to rule is going to be the ruler so um, uh, one of the contestants um, nearly won but the other one chopped off his right hand and flung it over um, his rival's uh, horse's head and so therefore, he already touched the land. He became the ruler. So it was decided. But um, the uh, obviously um, capability of being able to rule without both hands uh, is quite limited. So uh, to me, that was um, not just a nice bloody fairy tale, but this was actually highly symbolic to um, the flag that um, uh, the uh, Ulster flag actually took on, you know, the, the Red Hand of Ulster. Um, and uh, that's uh, actually the, the emblem of <laughs> that part of the world um, is almost like a symbol for we can't really, um, you know, act too well with just one hand, you know, the other hand is lost. So uh, yeah, to me that was that was quite a um, yeah from fairy mm -hmm. to political reality. Yeah. <laughs> so I, want to, I want to kind of um, go into you know a little bit about the documentary because there is you also kind of reference the brain and the mm -hmm. sheep's brain in particular and. I don't know whether that is also referencing hu human brain, but we know now. I, I was um, did a lot of study on the brain at the um, and have created lots of uh, drawings based on the brain. And when I started researching it, we only knew three percent of how the brain actually functioned um, at the turn of the century. But now we know that uh, trauma, you know, is a huge has a huge impact on the brain. Were you thinking about this as you constructed the documentary? Um, are you? It was yeah. It was um, the the brain um, cycle was basically an example of a, a performance installation and uh, an ongoing project that went on for the space of, uh, I think it was about a week or two. Uh, and uh, it ended up in a film, a uh, Super 8 movie. And uh, everything was basically in one idea. So the piece of work was 
already happening while it was being filmed. And uh, the initial idea of using that brain um, was a marshal of, um, yeah, like the sheep's brain, you know, the, the, the you know, literally the, the herd of sheep. And it, it was just so small um, and so malleable and, you know, the manipulation that was happening. And while this was happening, um, just the physicality of the brain being there, uh, because it wasn't preserved uh, over that um, period of time, it was like slowly decaying in just the water. And um, the uh, yeah, uh, colored inks I used to um, uh, suck in and out of it, um, were written down on a piece of official passport paper. So it was really like a um, yeah, subconscious uh, bit of manipulation and yeah, something, something almost like out of a nightmare. You know, it was, it was really um, meant to be uh, an uncertainty that was quite unsettling. So it was, it was uh, yeah, consciously on sub and interconscious mm, at yeah. the same time so yeah. um, and how and how thinking about how conflict and war impacts the our consciousness mm. as human beings and how we can live and of course this is you know highly relevant to what's happening in ukraine and other parts um, and um, other part, Myanmar, where people are fleeing conflict, and you know this this kind of state of crisis is um, a a real important issue for us to think about. So, but I want to, um, and we're actually going to be talking about this more at the Flow Symposium this year. Mm. But I want to. Um, move out on to some more recent because there's been you've migrated as an artist uh, between Northern Ireland and Berlin and I, I also I think it's important to say that you also created um, an, a kind of German embassy in Northern Ireland yeah it was, <laughs> it was my idea and just yeah, it was, it was just my idea for where I was living in a um, deconsecrated church, um, right at the middle of the, the almost invisible line of conflict. You know, to my left was um, the Schankel Road, or the Schankel, and to my right was the side of the Antrim Road. Um, so it always depended which side of the road you were walking up to. The left was Protestant, the right was Catholic. And um, so you could be attacked from both sides if you were on the wrong side of the street. And um, at night it became quite uh, dangerous to walk, walk there anyway or be there. So um, I just created like a safe space and then thought, okay, um, there's no actual um, embassy or, um, you know, any kind of um, oh. safe haven really <laughs> here at this point. So I just create like a fictional provisional German embassy in my uh, in my flat in my studio in the church and um, yeah basically uh, anybody who wanted shelter could just like stay there and you know there were sleeping bags and mattresses and stuff so if it was just overnight or you know just um, you know as guest artists um, to come over and stay as well so it was yeah it was just like a bit like that um, and, yeah, and this this kind of creating these interactive participatory works really uh, took on a different um, shape when you moved back to Berlin. And um, do you want to? Is there a particular image that I can bring up of a piece of work that you'd like to talk about? Or you could. Um, I'm just going to have to put up my files here with the names. Um, maybe I'm just going to pop this one up and see what happens. 
Yeah, the philosophy ones, that's projection. That was actually in the church at the time. Um, oh, was it? Yeah, that was, that was mm. uh, cinema. And uh, and we also, or I also did um, some projections that were just, you know, invading a, a, a pub and like a bar and like you just like, um, you know, had a slide projector and projected stuff in, on the wall as, as, you know, a couple of studios and artists get, putting together slides and so we were just kind of showing what happened in our studios you know in a more mm. public space than a gallery or a museum or something like that you know so it was really kind of more highly uh highly public <laughs> where people did not expect to um yeah view any art so the um the slides would be under philo philosophy uh so uh, I could get you into um, that. I think it was, would be yeah. This one, for example, I was in Berlin, um, the so-called Rost Belt of Berlin. And uh, it was part of an uh, um, uh, art project I had initiated with four other artists, um, um, which was called um, Everything Very Colorful As Long As It's Grey. And that was like an art project uh, against Nazis or neo-Nazis uh, who had their um, pub or bar um, a couple of streets further down and uh, so yeah we we, we kind of um, had our own work on this one was um my one which was called uh no nazi uh but don't do it with the good china and uh, the first part of it was uh to ask people what they thought um about um themselves and uh how they considered themselves being either German or what type of or nationality or uh, which part uh, of um, yeah society they viewed themselves in. So I had, had uh, you know just a very nice conversation with um, passers-by to the project room, which was a, a small shop. Uh, it wasn't a gallery; it was a shop um, where we swapped ideas and artworks as well. And um, so the second part of it was uh, to write all those um, keywords that people have told me on plates, which were used in the performance, uh, as you can see, with uh, a lot of like almost like a propaganda type uh, megaphone slogans. And um, it was almost like a using the keywords uh, to comment on them. And in the end, everything was swept under the carpet. Um, hmm. So uh, the third part of it was, um, you know, cleaning those plates that were remaining and um, making like a highly finely dressed uh, public private invitation only dinner on the pavement in front of the shop. So. Uh, it was uh, more like a particip participatory um, piece in terms of, uh, yeah, like a, almost like a social sculpture, what you might call it, uh, like a meal together where everybody contributed their favorite dish and, you know, you could cook or bring as, long, as much as you liked, but you had to be coming uh, uh, finely dressed, you know, like dressed up for the occasion. Um, and uh, so I put down like finest of linens and um, silver cutlery and everything. So it was, it was just like a very fine. Fine dining. Yeah, like a very <laughs> fine occasion, but uh, just somewhere on the pavement, as I said, in a, in a not very nice uh, neighborhood. So the plates and were the plates with people's um, identities that had been swept under the carpet, did they become, become the plates that people ate from? Yeah. Or? Yeah. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's 
That's lovely. So we're going to open it up for questions uh, to everybody here today. Uh, so if you have some um, questions, uh, please type them in the chat and uh, we will uh, try and answer them by the end of the broadcast. Um, so, so I'm interested in this kind of do you think there's been there's been an aesthetic um, transition between as you've migrated from you know one from Belfast to Germ to Berlin? Do you um, think I wouldn't I wouldn't really say really uh, aesthetic uh, transition, but. Um, no, I always interlink my political performances with um, philosophical ideas and uh, philosoph philosophical performances that are a bit more metaphysical as well. Um, <clears throat> my first um, performance I did outside of, uh, well, it wasn't really outside of non ein but my first performance I actually did after moving to Berlin. I did in Italy uh, between um, the land and the sea border. And that was the first of my threshold series um, performances, which are, um, yeah, between uh, the material world and the, uh, oh yeah, I have to go to the philosophy thing. Yeah, that's it. Um, between the material world and uh, the metaphysical, so to speak. Um, so you're going back into the consciously on sub interconscious uh, idea and um, where the material like a bird in flight changes into the shape of an abstract flight or the abstract shape of a flight. Mm. You know, the reality of um, some, something becomes just the abstract or abstracted uh, shape of it in uh, the ideal world. Um, the threshold series I had, um, that's actually like quite a, a longer text, but I'm keep it a, a little bit shorter. Um, it's uh, where the artist is the mediator between the line, the border between the virtual and physical territory. And uh, the physical territory contains all the laws of our outside world, um, where political territory, communal borders, man-made rules, regulations. And um, these are just uh, of a temporal existence. And the defining factor is time. So like a gesture, a glance, or a political decision can set the line. As in Her Heraclitus, um, we're stepping into the same river and not into the same. We are and we are not. So if time is that river, we are and we are not depending on the borders and limits we set ourselves uh, at that point in our personal and global history. And the borders we are um, set are in continuous flux throughout time. And this flux, uh, is um, the river of time in our physical world. And the border is that border to the virtual territory. And the virtual territory is the location of time as an abstract entity uh, with instinct streams, um, yet physically manifest through experience of becoming and decay. And these laws of nature, instinct, dreams, and imagination, chance, the chance to become and uh, yeah, to, to um, evolve. Uh, these are some of the laws within the virtual eternal flux. Um, the chance of that is uh, in the virtual territory is the river in Heraclitus' parable. So some thinkers and scientists call this uh, the law of chaos uh, in, the, in that sense of a chaos theory, um, but neither a gesture, a glance, or a bat of a butterfly's wings can change the course of laws here, 
um, it is almost like in that uh, what I would um, refer back to Plato's idea um, world, the, um, the world of the ideas, the abstract um, something that can never be in the material world. And uh, the uh, physical manifestation is the being that becomes and the becoming that is. So it's like stepping through a door in the act of stepping in or out. So the threshold is exactly that in between that being in the middle of it. Um, and so the, the entire series, and uh, this is from 2002 to um, the last image is uh, the Gimme Shelter um, performance, which was part of the Threshold series. Uh, in 2019. So they all kind of have this theme of um, going in and out um, of the tangible and the intangible from life to death and from um, uh, that bit where the artist becomes like almost like a light engine um, to um, bring the spark to uh, that high concentration of creation and, and like, you know, to, to actually concentrate uh, the action in such a way that it becomes like a, a almost a solidified um, spontaneous ritual in the real world. So, um, yes, and this, this kind of this idea of the spontaneous ritual, I know, is a really important part of your work and something that you've really, um, you know, developed over the years. Do you, I mean, throughout the Threshold series, when you're talking about these uh, borders and boundaries of consciousness to the sub, between the consciousness and the subconscious, you know, do you think that this is, you know, Milo Ponte talks about this heightening of perception that occurs through um, your know, embodied actions. Are you, is that something that you've been exploring in this, in this work, uh, metaphysically for yourself? I wouldn't say a heightening of um, perception as such, um, but almost like, uh, you know, as I said earlier, you know, the burden flight, you know, that, that applies to the political and the philosophical or the, um, you know, subconscious bit as well. You know, a burden flight is just a bird that flies, but um, through uh, the artist's um, focus on it, it changes into a shape, an abstract shape of, flight as such, you know, almost like the idea of flight, you know, so I'm quite uh, uh, still very fascinated by um, that idea world of Plato's where a circle is not a, um, a tangible circle, because you can never put the perfect idea of a circle cannot put put a tangent onto it, you can you cannot never touch it because it would be so perfect that no line could actually ever tangibly touch the perfect thing. So it's kind of this like highly abstract thing where I think um, in a physical sense uh, and possibly a metaphysical one as well, um, you go into almost like a different dimension. And I wouldn't actually see that as a heightened um, consciousness towards um, myself as a person, but uh, in reflection to everything more as a uh, yeah idea uh, of um, you know what is time and space? Do we do we have different dimensions and all, all those kind of questions? You know which uh, uh, well, I think that is what is time and space indeed. I think. You know, you, and, you, you can you can sort of like. Uh, you know, read up and reflect on certain bits and then kind of go, okay, uh, I actually will touch this like to a little bit in my real performance as a tangent, but <laughs> we don't want to get into tangents here. <laughs> well, actually, we've come to the end of the broadcast. 
because it is um, we're at the hour and I don't see any uh, questions from the audience but everybody has been very active in the chat today so thank you so much and uh, Robert Roberto uh, Nakar said can you please send him the PDF Yes, so no problem. Say, yeah, I will. <laughs> that's great. And um, many thanks to our active audience for listening and watching and being present today. And next week, we're going to, um, I'm very excited to be in conversation with James King, uh, another artist from Northern Ireland. So please uh, tune in uh, next week at the regular time of 11.15 a.m. and 18.15 European time. And um, then uh, we're also hoping to be announcing uh, the flow um, and who's going to be participating in it as we've been working very hard behind the scenes to uh, develop the program uh, for you. So uh, do tune in next week and many thanks for being here today and have a lovely rest of your week. And big, thing, big thank yous for sharing your really important and moving work today. And Many thanks for being in conversation. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for inviting me and the rest of the outside team. And yeah, you just touched a tiny little microscopic bit of all my work. So if you are all getting curious about it, um, you can find me on the internet, um, kaiketwizelman.com. Oh, there is uh, one last question that has come in. Um, or I think it's uh, I'm, it's from uh, Dagmar Glasnitzer Smith, and she says, um, "I'm so amazed at the comprehensiveness of and in your work. I can identify with the complexity. I feel the sense of transience and passage in the wearing of the white coat, and really interested in the laboratory person working." with such intensity switching between worlds mm -hmm. uh, so i think that is a great um uh place to end our conversation today and thank you again all so much okay thank you so much for uh, you know your attention and everything and uh yeah have a nice evening everybody yes thank you